Scott, thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii, Difficult Conversations to Make Good Trouble. And today we have one of the most respected trial lawyers and lawyers generally in Honolulu, in Hawaii, and in my experience of 45 years of doing this stuff, Jeff Portnoy, one of the senior partners at the Cades firm here, a very respected large firm. And Jeff's been not only a master litigator, First Amendment, uh, medical cases and others, but he's also been a commentator on sports events for the University of Hawaii. So Jeff is a guy who kind of like John Madden in the old NFL broadcast, brings the color commentator, the guy who really knows what's going on on the field and can tell you what's happening, what's about to happen and what's out there to get resolved. We're gonna talk about Maui fires today from a perspective not of the class action litigators like the big firms from the mainland who think the California wildfire approach is the way to go, eh, nor from the perspective of the defendants who are trying to protect themselves eh, against having the fires essentially end their viability and sustainability uh, financially and as organizations. We're gonna put it in context a little bit you uh, hero at UH and the Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement and others have put out some recent information. They've done some surveys, some studies, and there are things that we should be aware of here. 75% of the families are still in temporary housing, and that's running out. The FEMA funding, the sources, all of that. Only 58% of the individuals are employed full time. 24% are either part-time or unemployed, and they need additional work to get by. 60% reported they received no assistance after losing their jobs. The median income is $3,000 to $3,500 a month. See what you can do with that. 46% report urgent financial assistance is needed. Approximately half the families report urgent housing and food assistance is needed. Most of these people are long-term Maui residents, 82% for 10 years or more. 56% do not have a college degree or technical certification. 18% are single parent households with minor children. 74% are experiencing poor respiratory health. About the same amount are at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. Over 50% report depression compared to about 30% before the fires. About 1%, 1.3% reported contemplating suicide compared to 0.8% before the fires. About 24% reported they had no access to medical care. 101 people died. Over 2,200 structures were destroyed. Over 6 billion in damages. Over 135 individual plaintiff and class action lawsuits have been filed. 140 insurance companies have paid over a billion dollars in insurance payments on almost 4,000 claims with 1,689 total losses and have sued the private defendants, the utilities and the landowners to get that money back. <clears throat> the utilities have reported legal fields of approximately one and a half million dollars per week in the first quarter through September 30th of 2023. The governor's Wanohana Maui Wildfires Compensation Fund has received $1.75 million, $1 million in contributions. That's $75 million from Hawaiian Electric, $65 million from the state, $17.5 million from Kamehameha Schools, $10 million from Maui County, Two and a half million from Charter and Spectrum, two and a half million from Hawaiian Telecom, and two and a half million from the West Maui Land Company. Each qualifying death or serious injury claimant will be paid one and a half million for full release of the fired claims. Up to early June, 48 of the 101 death claims have applied for the Maui wildfires compensation fund. 17 of these serious permanent injury claimants have applied. We'll see what happens. 
So Jeff, which direction do we go? Full on balls to the wall litigation, or is there another way? Well, let me start with a disclaimer. We are not involved in any of the litigation. We're just conflicted out because in other matters, we represent many of the defendants in the lawsuit. But I have been asked and consulted by lawyers both here and on the mainland about Hawaii process, uh, not dealing with the potential liability of any particular defendant. I've been asked my opinions on what I think certain cases might be worth, with that, again, without uh, attributing anyone at fault. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I've been in touch with some of the most prominent, or they've been in touch with me, prominent law firms from California uh, who dealt with the California wildfires. They're very well respected, uh, both by the California judiciary and I believe by the Hawaii judiciary. Unfortunately, we have a number of sharks that have swum over here uh, that have breached all kinds of ethical and other responsibilities and advertising and promoting themselves from other jurisdictions, including California, Florida, Texas. Uh, I'm on the ODC and I know that there's gonna be a number and already are a number of claims for potential violations of lawyer ethics. And unfortunately, Chuck, a mass disaster like this brings out both the best and the worst in our profession. So that leads to how do you resolve these claims? Some people are in these claims, some lawyers, for nothing but the easy money they're going to make, whether it's 25% or 33% for doing virtually nothing. Other people are in this, frankly, to benefit the clients, to try to get them as much money as they can in a reasonable time without expending hundreds of thousands of dollars and, frankly, months and months, if not years, of litigation. I have not been a fan of the fund. Honestly, I don't think it doesn't fit all people. To say you're going to pay a million and a half dollars for every death claim is uh, a windfall for a few and a dramatically not appropriate payment for others. I mean, if you were a 35-year-old male earning $150,000 a year with four kids, your claim is worth seven or eight million dollars. If you're a 90 year old retired sugar worker with no dependents, then maybe your claim is worth less than a hundred million, a million and a half. But to have a one size fits all to me just doesn't do it. And if you're badly injured, if you were burned, a million and a half dollars, if you're burned over 70% of your body, that's peanuts. You know, so I don't know the definition. Do you have seriously injured? Does it, does it, has it been defined somewhere? So look, some people should grab that fund, get their money now while they're still alive, invest it or do what they need to do. And other people should say, no, I'm sorry. That's just not what my claim is worth. And the first four cases I'm told, are going to go to trial in November. They have uh, figured out a way to pick four representative cases. And I think after those are resolved, both as to liability and potentially for damages, a matrix, a matrix will be set up and cases will fall in line. But I guarantee you there will be some lawyers, some from here, maybe more from the mainland, who are going to say, oh, no. Oh, no, we're going to hang in here until we can get whatever we can possibly get for ourselves. And that's unfortunate. If we step back. In the end, and we look at this, as Bill Yuri, master mediator, says, from the balcony, the long term, big picture, objective perspective and the moral high ground, if there is one. Eventually, there are funds and resources for the individuals and the community. Ultimately, wherever those come from, those funds and resources will have to be allocated to the individuals and the community in ways that help enable them rebuild, recover, and go on. 
Well, that's an assumption that may not be valid. Okay. Uh, because I think there's plenty of speculation as to the financial viability of at least one major defendant. Uh, lots of rumors about, you know, potential bankruptcy, which would leave lots of people without funding from that defendant. There are others that have hugely deep pockets. Uh, the county of Maui allegedly only has $10 million in insurance. Uh, now, whether they want to, you know, increase taxes to pay for whatever judgment might be entered against them. And we see them fighting among themselves. It's not like they're in a joint effort. There are counterclaims and cross claims and you did this and you did that. No, you did this and you did that. You know, what hasn't happened here, and I don't know the answer, is what happened with the World Trade Center. That's the model of how to handle mass tort casualties. And that was done brilliantly, both by the defendants and by the plaintiffs and by the lawyers, and particularly by the two or three mediators who managed to resolve, I believe, all of the claims with the resources available. We don't have that. We have a mini, a mini me plan with this fund of very limited amounts of money for the total amount of damages which are going to be ultimately paid out. I can just tell you that. I mean, I do enough personal injury to know what claims are worth. So uh, I don't know why they haven't been able to come up with a, with a plan that more closely relates to the World Trade Center. I know in California, they, they tried that, to come up with a plan and hopefully they will. But meanwhile, I hear that mainland lawyers on the defense side are billing more than a million dollars a week. And so how long can Hawaiian Electric go on paying what may have already been $100 million in legal fees? I don't know the amount. I'm just guessing. No, and you make a really good point because there may be limited amounts of insurance. There may be questions of whether coverages apply or not. One of the problems is that much of the insurance is reportedly what we call cannibalizing. It applies to attorney's fees and costs to reduce the amount of insurance that's available to pay for the liability. That, that well is being drawn from at, at gulps, not sips. In addition to that, because of the joint and several liability law in tort law in Hawaii, in the US. Theoretically, the utilities and the large landowners are sort of like the smaller insurance company and the larger insurance company. If the smaller insurance company's money all gets used up, the rest has to come from the larger insurance company. So Kamehameha schools and the large landowners may be put in a position where they wind up being like the excess insurer for Hawaiian Electric. Well, and, and, the, and the unspoken problem here is how it's going to affect all the rest of us. And we already see it in what's happening to homeowners insurance premiums. Only three companies are writing condominium insurance now in Hawaii. We saw what happened in Florida and in California. People need to get ready for a 300, 500, 2,000% increase in their homeowners and in their condominium insurance, if they can even get it. And so the rest of us are about ready and are already beginning to feel the hurt, not from the people who were injured or killed or lost a property, but everybody else and wait for property taxes. Look at the county of Maui if they have to find a way to fund. So this is a disaster that is going to affect everybody who lives in the state of Hawaii, not just the unfortunate people that suffered a direct tragedy over in Lahaina. The other thing that leaps out at all of us, I think, is that you have very, very high power sophisticated, well-resourced attorneys, including large mainland law firms on both sides, representing both the claimants and the defendants. So the individuals and the groups of them, large groups, small groups, are, 
are represented by experienced, sophisticated counsel. So are the defendants, Hawaiian Electric, Kamehameha Schools, uh, Maui Land, the county, the state. But in all that litigation, those 1,855 <laughs> lawsuits. There'll be a lot more. We still there, see local firms and mainland firms advertising meetings multiple times a month to try to sign up sign up i can't believe there's anybody left that hasn't already been solicited and signed up but they're still running meetings to talk about their rights quote unquote and to sign up people claim that's not advertising i uh, beg to differ i mean we're seeing some of the I, i'm not indicting any particular lawyer or law firm okay i, I just talk about my view of ethics and to have these meetings and to have these advertisements that are soliciting people and having people going out and soliciting people you say there's 1800 lawsuits that may be a small number by the time every single person who potentially has a claim has been signed up out of the 18 we're talking about 135 individual plaintiff and class action suits the 1855 number, I think, was the number of claims or claimants or individuals. But in addition to that, we have a situation where the court, Judge Peter Cahill, one of our most respected and experienced trial judges, has appointed three mediators, two retired mainland California judges with welfare case experience, and Keith Hunter, our leading mediator and arbitrator here, an extremely highly respected man um, and a personal friend for many years. Couldn't made a better choice. The governor has, as his consultant, Andy Weiner, an experienced litigator, an experienced mediator, an experienced political consultant, as former chief of staff for Brian Schatz. Andy has brought in Ken Feinberg and Camille, Ken's partner, who put together the <clears throat> 9-11 settlements who put together many of the others, uh, Katrina and others, very experienced in this area. So we have people and the administrator of that Maui Fires Compensation Fund, retired Judge Ronnie Barra, very highly respected, both professionally and individually. So we have people who appear to be really motivated to try to find solutions that will work for both the community and the individuals. And those have to be coordinated. You cannot rebuild the individual lives without rebuilding the community, nor can you re revive the community without restoring the individuals to economic and physical and mental, emotional health. What has to happen? It's been over a year. So what has happened? Just a lot of procedural stuff going on in court, lawyers trying to sign up as many people as they can. I would guess maybe if you said a bunch of claims have been settled by insurance companies, I'm assuming those are property claims. Correct. I, uh, there's probably thousands more that have not yet been resolved. The insurance companies, as you point out, want to be subrogated and want to get their money back from, from somebody. The defendants are bleeding millions of dollars every week in legal fees. And there's going to be a series of trials in November. And I think, unfortunately, that is looks like the way it's going. Uh, you know, that that's an option. You try a few cases, let the plaintiffs pick a couple. I don't know why the defendants would pick a couple. The facts are going to be the same. But you're going to pick varying cases based upon damages and try to get a matrix. And I would doubt that very many cases are going to get tried after that. I really would. I think most lawyers will see the matrix, will see what jurors have done, and with the help of these mediators, will figure out what is a death claim worth for various types of individuals based upon their age, their families, their economic situation. What is a burn case based upon how much of the body is burned? How much is a loss of a limb? How much is emotional distress worth? And you'll get a matrix. It's not impossible. It, it's done all the time, but you need to set that matrix up. My guess is right now, they haven't been able to do that 
other than saying we'll pay a million and a half dollars for every death claim and whatever it is for the substantial damages, which I just don't think works. Some people will be well overcompensated and some will be unbelievably undercompensated. So I guess these four are going to have to go. And don't forget, there are some cooler cases, too. So, um, right. There, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? I think there is, but it's a very long tunnel. And we've seen in asbestos, tobacco, Roundup, <laughs> benchmark trials to set those parameters, to set those matrices. And, and that may be what some of the people have in mind here. Is it also possible to have benchmark mediations? Sure. To try to work out those matrices. Yeah, but you're dealing with egos. Yes. The lawyers. I'm talking about the lawyers, not the party. You're dealing with egos. If a lawyer, if someone comes to, to one of these lawyers from uh, anywhere and says, well, we just finished the mediation and uh, the mediator says, uh, I decided this claim based upon these facts is worth X. That lawyer goes, that's ridiculous. It's worth 10x. That's gonna that's gonna happen. I guarantee you that's gonna happen. And so you have to have good faith on the part of the attorneys that they're all reputable. And frankly, I don't think that's the case. Just from the little that I know about some of the people that have come in here within 24 hours. And you know, and you look at the ads and you you know that not everybody is your friendly neighborhood lawyer who lives two blocks down that you know you can trust. And hopefully the local lawyers are going to gain control. They know the environment. They're going to work with some very good mainland lawyers and get to where you want this to go, because I don't disagree with you. Individual claims can get settled, but what does it do for the community? Would it conceivably be possible for the two government defendants, the state and the county, separately or together, <clears throat> to engage in a couple of benchmark mediations or trials, try and set that matrix, settle those out, get good faith settlement approval to protect them against liability for contribution to any of the other defendants, and essentially set the parameters for themselves so that from there on out, it's all on the private defendants. Is that a possibility? Could that happen? Anything is possible, but all you have to do is read the newspapers to know that the state and the county aren't getting along, even under the so-called investigation. The county is objecting to their witnesses being subpoenaed or interviewed by the state, and the state claims they have to have this in order to come up with their, quote, report. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, this is not exactly at least what you see in the media, and from what I hear, a combined defense effort. No, oh, I hear you. Anything is possible. I think it's very unlikely. So, Jim, how do we get the community's interests and priorities, whatever that may be and whatever they may be differing and maybe even competing and conflicting as they may be, how do we get those understood, respected, honored, served, taken into account? That's a great question. And, you know, I, I don't have an easy answer. I mean, I, I think it just takes a recognition that something horrible happened. Somebody, some companies, some combination of factors combined to destroy a community. And how do you rebuild the community? I think the legislature has recognized that it's going to take billions of dollars. And frankly, as I said earlier, we're all going to wind up paying. The community is not Lahaina. It's not Maui. We're all going to wind up paying and increased taxes or, you know, increased insurance premiums. And that's, that's just the reality. I mean, you know, you're going to rebuild this, the, the town. You're not going to rebuild the town by giving somebody a million and a half dollars that they need for their own lives. You're going to rebuild the town by individuals rebuilding their businesses and their restaurants and their hotels. But what about the infrastructure? There's, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure that needs to be, 
you know, repaired. And it's underway. The federal government's going to contribute. So it's a very complex issue. It's not like it hasn't happened in other places. And we just have to learn how to take the good things that happened in these other mass disasters, try to get rid of the bad things, and make things work. What, if anything, in your mind, makes the Lahaina situation different? Well, I don't know. I mean, isolation, the things that make Hawaii different, uh, both geographically and culturally. Uh, it's a tourism dependent community. I mean, there was really nothing in Lahaina anymore but tourism since the mill went under, you know, condominiums, hotels, and the services that people need from the condos in the, the hotels, you know, ocean activities, uh, art galleries, uh, uh, restaurants, you know, you name it. So, you know, the wildfires in California weren't in a tourist area. There were some residents living there, but they were, you know, plus I think there's an economic difference. The people that were in some of those California wildfires were so very wealthy people. I mean, Lahaina's, I don't know what the average income in Lahaina was, but I'll guess it's pretty low for permanent residents. The most of them were retired uh, mill workers, probably living on very modest pensions, living in 70, 80 year old wooden houses that were built back in the 30s and 40s. Yeah, there was, you know, a few rich people that lost a house or two. So culturally, economically, geographically, I think Lahaina poses enormous problems. The rebuilding costs of just building your own house, even if you're not in Lahaina, is exponentially higher than it would be in most other places. Can you imagine what has to be brought in uh, to, to rebuild Lahaina? So I think it's unique. But I don't think it's so unique that you can't learn from other places that have experienced similar tragedies. Maybe not fire, maybe a flood, whatever. Okay. okay. So for the community, we know that beside physical infrastructure, material infrastructure, there's technological infrastructure. There's healthcare infrastructure, there's education infrastructure, there's transportation infrastructure. One of the big problems here, people couldn't get out. Many died because they couldn't. Um, I talked to a guy a few days after the fire who was over here, hey, and I asked him, how did you get out? He said, I knew all the back Cane Hall roads that you could traverse. That's the only way that he survived. Um, and you couldn't put the word out for that. The transportation and communication system was not available. So we need to not only rebuild what was there, we need to rebuild what needs to be there for people to have sustainable, viable lives going forward that are as disaster resistant as possible. Years ago, I still remember this like it was yesterday, we had a tsunami warning on Oahu and the sirens went off and everybody was told to go home, okay? If you lived out in East Oahu, like I did, if you were lucky enough to get on the freeway and then get on Kalani Only Only Highway after two hours, you were 200 yards from the ocean and stuck in a traffic jam that you had no way of avoiding. And if there had been a tsunami, thousands of people would have drowned. We were so, so that's just part of what the island problems are. I mean, we see it now. If there's a car accident on Kalani Anioli Highway or on the H3, get ready for two or three hours before you can get home. And that's just on a traffic accident. Lahaina had one basic road in and out. We all know it. We've been there many times. There were some other ways they put the upper road in, et cetera. But Front Street was where most of the tourists knew to go, and most of the local people had to get to Front Street, and they couldn't. Cars were parked on both sides of these small, teeny roads that were built in the 30s and 40s. They couldn't get anywhere. Poles fell down or, you know. And how many people died because they jumped into the ocean? 
because they had no other place to go. So how do you rebuild a, a town like Lahaina with enough access roads in and out? What's that going to cost? And how can you do that? You know, and I think, and we're out of time for today, which is unfortunate. We could do this for hours more. But we didn't solve all the problems, you mean? I know in mediation, and you and I have talked about this, we're just trying to get people through adversity, conflict, whatever you want to call it, as intact as possible, with the best possible combination of opportunities, choices, and resources to go forward with their lives, with each other, with the people that they live with, that they care about, that they work with, that they try to serve in their personal lives and their work lives. The question we leave for all of you is, if we were going to come together to try and accomplish that, what might it look like? Who would need to be involved and in contributing? And what would need to happen in order for us to have the best chance to get to that intact result with opportunities, choices, and resources that could help us go forward? That's our question. Think Tech Hawaii, Jeff Fornoy, thanks so much. Aloha.